Okay, uh, Paula, so as, as uh, it would have escaped you, uh, is a native uh, speaker of Spanish. Uh, she teaches languages in a secondary school in the West Midlands. She's an advocate of uh, research-based uh, practice and uh, high impact teaching and learning. Uh, and she, she tries to foster love of languages in her students and develop their cultural awareness and, and communication skills. Uh, she's very active on Twitter and she has her own blog, which I, I think you've just started called Teach MFL. So look it up and we'll send you the link also uh, to the blog. Uh, I'm very excited that Paula has offered to run a we webinar for us and she has a lot of, of brilliant ideas and uh, enthusiasm. So I'm really looking forward to her talk. Paula, we're ready whenever you are. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Stefan. That's brilliant. And thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today. I'm really, really excited to be here and it's wonderful to see so many of you joining us. Um, as Stefan mentioned, uh, there's my contacts for Twitter uh, and my blog. But before we start, just don't worry at all about taking notes, copying links or information uh, because the, the webinar is being recorded and you will get these as well as all the slides that will be made available to you. Uh, and I have put in all the slides, all the links to different websites, blogs and apps that I will mention. Uh, so I know also often people write on the, on the comments links to all the websites, resources, ideas, which is absolutely brilliant. And what I will do at the end, once Stefan uh, sends me the transcript of the chat, I will add another slide to the presentation with a compilation of all of your suggestions. So for now, just enjoy the presentation. And I just hope that when we finish, you feel motivated and full of ideas and strategies to practice speaking with your students. So let's get talking. During the next hour, we're going to explore why it is important to develop fluency and spontaneity, the use of target language in the classroom and what it looks like, uh, the number of challenges and barriers that we uh, face to practice Spanish, uh, well, any language <laughs> in, in the class, and how we could potentially break those barriers, uh, especially by developing student self-efficacy. We're also going to look at the principles of effective speaking practice. And we are going to explore a variety of activities, tasks that you can use to, to practice speaking with your students. M more importantly, how we move from that structured practice to the spontaneity. And we will finish looking at something that is very relevant to all of us at the moment, uh, whilst the schools are closed and we're teaching remotely, which is how can we actually engage the students in a speaking practice whilst we're teaching remotely? and how can technology help us to do that? So when I started planning this webinar, I thought a lot about the title that I would use and what it would be useful to share. And I have blindly gone for fluency and spontaneity, but why is it important? Now, Hugh argues that speech is the primary mode of communication and social interaction. He also argues that fluency is what your students want to achieve, what motivates them and what they want to accomplish. He goes beyond that and says that to be fluent in a language is the lay person's goal. Along the same lines, Donati suggests that because the speech requires you to retrieve quickly, uh, it develops memory and it has been shown to be beneficial uh, for learning lexical and grammatical knowledge. She also suggests that it can be a facilitator for writing. And one of her students said that it made them more confident in their spelling. So there are many, many gains um, from practicing the speaking. Uh, additionally, when we look at the new GCT specifications, this requires students to develop a spontaneous talk. Uh, they aim to develop their confidence and how it, they express their thoughts and their ideas in an spontaneous and fluent way, as well as encouraging students to become independent users of the language. If we read the specifications in more detail, um, it also requires the students to respond to questions in the target language with minimal or no preparation, using pronunciation and intonation accurately. So it's quite a high demand uh, in the new specs. I have put the link as well if you want to download the whole document. 
But so we know that research suggests that developing a spontaneity is very important and for language acquisition. But what is the reality in the languages classroom? Who would you say normally speaks more target language in a lesson? Is it you or is it your students? There's a lot of research that has been dedicated to this, um, primarily focusing on the prevalence of the use of target language and the, the quantity and the amount. And some of the key findings from Ofsted indicate that often the students have limited opportunities to communicate in the language and that teachers would normally overestimate the, 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 well, the time that they're giving the students to practice and underestimate the, one, the time that they use to speak themselves. Uh, they quoted a comment from a teacher after viewing a videotape of their own lesson who said, I had no idea I did so much talking and didn't let the student practice. And I wonder whether that's a came for some of us sometimes. Um, in fact, it seems that peer-to-peer -peer talk is the least common form of use of target language in the classroom when it's actually one of the most effective and impactful. Um, even more, in 2012, a report from BBC News indicated that it's just 9% of 14 to 15 years old in England that can use their first foreign language independently. Now, we can already think 9% is not a huge number, but especially if we compare it to the figures in Sweden, for example, when the percentage goes up to 84, uh, I mean 82%, it's even more shocking. But this is no surprise at all due to the number of challenges that we face to engage a student in practicing speaking. Now, researchers argue that it speech is transient and it's context specific, so it's difficult to duplicate and it's difficult to plan for. It's also a very cognitively demand task. You have to listen whilst you're speaking, retrieve a variety of vocabulary, uh, grammar, patterns, um, and we know that our, our, cognitive, our cognition is limited and our working memory is limited. That it can also be really, really difficult to manage the interactions in a class of 30 students, as we may worry about the students presenting off class behavior, going back to speaking in their first language, uh, or even behavior management. And that's not to mention the time pressure and the assessment demands that come with teaching an exam group. So many teachers feel that if they were to focus on the use of target language, they wouldn't necessarily be able to cover the whole curriculum or syllabus. And one of the main barriers that we face in the class is the student's unwillingness to communicate. And this is normally underpinned by their perceived level of self-efficacy, whether they think that they are actually able to speak in a different language altogether. So, what can we do about this? What can we do to ensure that the students participate and engage in the speaking and we can increase the self-efficacy and make them feel like they can actually do it? Um, now, speaking can be a use for interaction across different people, between the students and teachers, the students with the peers, and it, this can be really, really motivated. If the students are used to listening, and is speaking in the class in the target language, it creates a climate in which it's just seen as the norm and it favors group identity. And furthermore, it can enable pupils to see themselves as language speakers. Um, what is more crucial is giving the students to give the opportunity to be successful early in the lesson or early in a unit of work. So rather than rushing to production and asking them a lot of open-ended questions or to talk for a minute about a particular topic, it's really important that they can automatize the learning through extensive and intensive repetition of chunks and tasks. And we will talk about this um, a little bit more later. But when we look at the, the student perceptions of the use of language in the class, it's also seen that the students takes to experiment more when they are speaking before committing to this when it's written. And so it's actually a really nice opportunity and a nice chance for them to explore and be creative in their use of the language. And this may cause an, an additional challenge for us, which is 
what if students made a mistake? How do we manage those errors and how do we go about correcting them? Um, now, what research shows is that actually language is acquired when students are trying to convey a message to someone else, but this is non-dependent on, on their accuracy, so it's more based on communication. And of course, what we want to avoid is that these mistakes are automatized or as Conti would say, they become fossilized. But if you pre-plan how you approach that error correction and the areas that you're going to focus on and how you're going to go around correcting those errors, whether it's going to be at the time or later on as an individual or as a group, it can really help to increase the student's confidence. And all of this is really underpinned by encouraging and rewarding participation, being really enthusiastic about the student use of target language. So whilst well, we're going to look at a number of strategies, tasks and activities that you can use in the classroom and also on online teaching, it's important to remember that that's underpinned by a number of principles that are useful to make sure that the speaking is meaningful and effective. And the first principle would be modeling through listening. Then it's really important that the students develop the speed and accuracy of their production through extensive practice. And once we've accomplished that, once they're able to produce the language um, with the speed and accuracy, that's when we need to consider how we move a student from a structured practice to spontaneity. And we're going to look at all of this together. Now, as I mentioned, modeling through listening would be one of the key principles um, when we discuss speaking development. The theory and the strategies are quite extensive and it does go beyond the scope of this webinar, so I won't get into a lot of detail. But what I would suggest is that you have a look at the uh, blogs that I have posted here. So you have a link here and here to two of Conti's blogs that explain really well. Uh, the different processes involved in this, in listening, the micro skills and how we can um, use this to model a speech. Uh, and he also presents a number of tasks and the strategies to practice this. But if, if we look at the diagram, it, a student cannot really process meaning or understanding before they understand things like where a word begins and ends or identifying different sounds. Um, actually, it was quite interesting that the BBC News report found that only 1% of the students in England were able to follow complex forms of a speech. And this is compared to the average in Europe of about 30%. Um, so without getting into a lot of detail, what I would suggest is the key idea behind this is you can't really speak if you can't listen. How are you going to answer a question if you don't know what they're asking you? Um, we have to understand the micro skills that are involved and provide opportunities to practice each of these micro skills um, individually and make the purpose of the task clear to the students. Uh, we may, for example, ask them to match sounds to uh, letters or to pictures. We could give them a text in which the words are together and they have to write a line to indicate where a word ends so they can recognize the word boundaries. Um, but what's really, really important is that some of the key elements that are modeled through listening are pronunciation and intonation. And once these patterns are recognized by the students and they're internalized and uh, automatized, the cognitive demand of speaking is reduced massively because they don't have to actively be thinking about it, it just comes fluently and naturally. The second principle refer to developing speed and accuracy through extensive and intensive practice. And like we were saying, it's a very cognitively demanding task. And if we want to reduce cognitive loads, um, it is important that the key vocabulary, the pronunciation, patterns, grammar are all automatized because once this is in your long-term memory and the long-term memory of your students, it will reduce cognitive loads. And it can only go into your long-term memory through um, 
to repetition and retrieval. What I mean by extensive and intensive practice is that we have to ensure that things are revisited over time and that key language is recycled and key structures. So we, we also know from cognitive science research that our working memory can only hold an average of three items of, uh, of information at a time. In, for your students, it may be between two and four. So if instead of asking the students to memorize and remember individual words, they practice and they rehearse um, that information through chunks, you are reducing the number of items that the working memory needs to access, uh, which is where things as a strategy like using sentence builders can be really, really useful. And the stage of developing a speed and accuracy and the stage of practice uh, really re uh, relies on imitation and rehearsal, and it requires practice through highly controlled tasks, having access to a number of escaffolds and materials. And this is something that the activities that we're going to look at have in common. So how do we promote that uh, fluency? How do we get the students producing the language fast and accurately, and how do we practice this? Uh, I thought about a compilation of strategies that we could use uh, with a variety of pronunciation games, retrieval practice, reading out loud strategies, and other games that I'm going to talk through. This is one of my favorite games to play with the students. They absolutely love it every time we play. Uh, I call it Ole in Spanish, but I also know that in French, the students um, say Ulela. So the idea behind this activity is that you present um, a, a number of images with vocabulary relevant to the unit. For example, if they were looking at free time and the different sports. And what a student have to do is repeat after you. So when you say a word, you're pointing at a picture. Let's say, for example, I'm pointing at the basketball ball and I say ballon testo. If I'm pointing at the same picture I'm saying, the student have to repeat after me. However, if um, you're pointing at a different picture, I say ballon festo when I'm actually pointing at the tennis racket, the student need to stay silent. Now, it would often be the case that someone starts repeating just because they become so used to repeating after you. Um, and at that point, the rest of the class needs to pick up on that and say ole to them. Uh, you can play it in a number of different ways. You could say that the students that start repeating, if they are called upon, they, they are excluded from the game. You could do it as a um, dividing the class in different groups and see who has the most people standing towards the end. That's completely up to you, but it's a really, really fun game. Now, when it comes to pronunciation, they also love tongue twisters or trabalenguas. And I joke a lot to, uh, with my students about that. I would often say trabalenguas uh, really, really quickly and just be like, oh, yeah, I spent a whole night practicing yesterday just to be able to say it today. And they really, really engage with it. They really want to be able to say it correctly, to say it faster than you. And um, you may have the students that the struggle to say a whole tongue twister. So I would normally scaffold this activity when we start by selecting lists of vocabulary. At this point, I'm not really interested in the meaning of the words, but rather in the pronunciation. I'm pointing out uh, the different exceptions of pronunciation in a specific language. Uh, so for example, in Spanish, the H is mute, so you wouldn't say helado or historia, you would say helado or historia. And I would pose a challenge to the students and say, let's say who can read the whole list um, accurately from the top. They will try, let's say someone gets as far as the fifth word, then brilliant, someone else has a go, they may get to the eighth words and that way until we get to the end. And because you're pointing out the difference and making explicit what the sound sounds like with something they can relate to, like E is pronounced as in B, and um, they pay special attention to the pronunciation rather than to the meaning. So it reduces the cognitive load massively. But for your higher ability students, it also starts really interesting conversations. So when I did this with my year nine, there were a few of them uh, asking me, Miss, what's halterophilia? Now, 
that's why lifting and I don't expect them to know that it's not even for a higher paper and that's absolutely fine but they are being curious about the language and uh, they will probably remember because they've read that list of words in a number of times through a lesson or through a week and I would also um, leave the pronunciation of more difficult words with the J and the R um, to practice separately that's something that I would really emphasize as well and correct on the on the pronunciation but make it really specific and, and just have a giggle with it like it's huevo <laughs> and really emphasize it and um, yeah it, it's really really engaging they love it now retrieval practice especially with lower years such as key stage three there's a variety of activities and tasks that you can do to promote to promote that structured practice in a controlled way that focus mainly on um, vocabulary retrieval and the repetition over and over to make sure that it goes to your long-term memory. One of those games is not on process, uh, so you can either play, play that as a whole class with two different groups or you can play it in pairs. But the idea is that the students choose a cell by saying the item, so um, a sandwich or la fruta, um, as a variation, you can also ask them to form a sentence using a word and you can make it as complicated as you want. Um, you could say if, if you have been practicing um, the different verbs to refer to different meal times, they may need to think about whether they would use desayuno, como, ceno. If you're practicing the past tense, they may need to say ayer comí, yesterday I ate, uh, depending on the group that you're teaching. Um, word tennis, that's another simple and nice activity in which the students take turns saying words that are linked. Uh, it, would, it, it works really well with vocabulary and sequence, such as the months of the year, the days of the week, numbers, uh, but it's not restricted to that. So the idea is one student would say that word out loud, the other student would say the next, then it goes back to the first student. And the first one that hesitates loses that round. So they need to be able to say that fairly quickly, like uno, dos, tres. Um, but again, it's not restricted to just a sequence of vocabulary like numbers. You could do a category. You could say, name as many animals as you can, or name as many food items as you can. Um, and you could even do it with high ability students with links, that, um, with words that are linked through their meaning. So, for example, one would say gato, the other one perro, someone uh, zorro, and the other Antonio Banderas, and then they speak talking about famous people, and that's absolutely fine. Um, accumulation game. Uh, you may have heard you refer to accumulation game as I went to the market and I bought. Uh, it's a really good game to practice memory skills, especially with younger learners. The idea behind it is that the students have to say what the partner has said and then add a new word each turn. Uh, so for example I could say fui al supermercado y compré chocolate, the next person fui al supermercado y compré chocolate y galletas. Now when you only have four or five items that's great, when it starts getting to 15 or 20 um, it starts getting more and more difficult to remember. We mentioned reading out loud, uh, which is something that has really high value in lessons. Uh, research shows that it doesn't only improve speaking, but it also improves reading skills, the reading fluency, reading for comprehension, and even writing. Uh, you, you could play, for example, mind readers using um, vocabulary builders and uh, sentence builders. So, in mind readers, what you would do is that a student thinks of a sentence. So in the example here, for example, me encanta la informática porque es muy útil, and they write it on a mini whiteboard. Uh, then one or two other students try to guess the sentence by choosing a word from each of the block in your sentence builder. If they choose the word correctly, they can continue and try guessing. But if they don't, they have to start all over. So there's a lot of repetition involved and they continue reading sentences over and over. They don't necessarily need to focus about the grammar, but again, it's something you can have a conversation and say, why do you think I chose to use different colors? And that starts to become automatic and they may not have 
an explicit understanding of adjective agreement, but they are targeting that in, in an intuitive form. And trapdoor is really, really similar to sentence builders, but instead of having specific chunks of vocabulary, uh, you would choose a word from each of the boxes. As an extension, um, they could ask the students to translate their partner's response into English. They could come up with their own words to uh, to each box. And when it comes to reading out loud, um, I, I try to bring and speak into as much as I can to the lessons. And even when they have a longer piece of writing uh, of reading, whether we're focusing on the meaning or on the form, and uh, whether they're looking at doing comprehension questions or they're looking at and different examples of the use of verbs, time markers, whatever it is they're doing. Uh, there's a game that you can also do, which is palomitas, as a student can sometimes be a bit reluctant to, to read out loud longer text if it's as a whole class. Um, and what you would do is you would ask a student to start reading, and once they reach the first point, they say palomitas and the name of the next student that needs to carry on reading. That also encourages the students to listen to one another and be able to follow where they are within the text. Uh, and as I said, you can bring it into to literally pretty much anything you do in the lesson. One really nice example from Rachel Hawks uh, was using a speaking frame for other activities, uh, like the odd one out. The students are encouraged to discuss which one they believe it is the odd one out by using a speaking frame. So they could say, Creo que el intruso es mm, la araña porque es la única palabra femenina or whatever it is that they can spot in the different in the odd one out. Uh, you can again use literacy maths to photo descriptions, for example, and whilst in GCC this is scaffolding and um, user materials will need to be phased out slowly. It's good to get the rate and now to start it just repeating chunks of learning like en la foto hay tres personas están comiendo and repeat it again and again many games that you may have seen before like battleships uh, use of devices speed dating running dictation and um, i won't go into a lot of detail now but if you have a specific question on how you play any of these games uh, you can let me know uh, and i will point you in the right direction but also something like using a stimuli and um, this acting, singing, reading poetry. So we've looked more or less at how we can get the students to practice um, speaking through highly controlled tasks with a lot of scaffolding and modeling. But what we really want to do then is consider how we're going to move our students from a structured practice to spontaneous talk. And Language is acquired when students attempt to communicate a message to another student, regardless of the accuracy. Therefore, it's important to provide opportunities to do pair or group speaking and uh, use tasks in which um, it is what they refer as information gap tasks, in which the information that the students need to complete the task is not readily available to them. When we talk about the spontaneity, it really refers to the automatization of grammar and vocabulary use across a, vari uh, across a variety or a wide range of contexts. And it's important before we move to spontaneous talk and open any tasks that they have had the opportunity to develop um, that speed and that accuracy beforehand. And it really is about having a skillful mix of, um, of activities that focus on fluency and that focus on accuracy. And in this phase, the, the scaffolds and the materials that a student had in the past would start to be phased out. So what kind of activities could we do to promote that spontaneity and to get the students talking without as many scaffolds and materials? It's a list of activities that we're going to go through and um, spot the difference. So using a picture like the one in the slide, you could ask students to discuss with one another 
um, the differences and describe. So, for example, in the photo, the la derecha son las tres, y en la de la izquierda son las diez. Um, el perro es pequeño, or el perro es grande. As a variation, you could also ask the students um, to work in pairs, give each of them a picture, that, and they are not allowed to see each other. So they have to ask questions to try and come up with what the differences are. So they may ask, as a soul, is it sunny? And the other student could say, no, está nublado, um, or que hora es, de que color es el coche. So it gives them asking questions and, and answering to those questions, which um, require them to think a lot about the grammar and, the, um, and using vocabulary that is a bit more spontaneous. Uh, when it comes to using photos, and we briefly mentioned photo descriptions, but you could also do it in an inverted manner, in which the student describes a photo, and the rest of the students in, in a group or in a pub, they try to draw the picture as best as they can, without having seen it before. And at the end of the task, uh, they compare it to the original one and see who was closer. So it encourages them to to make a verbal description of the picture right there and then. Um, inverted headbands, or guess who? So normally you would play this game in a highly scaffolded way, very structured, in which you would ask, you would give the students perhaps a list of questions like, soy chica, soy chico, tengo el pelo rubio, and they would start to guess which options are not valid and by process of elimination come up with the answer. You could also do it invertedly and encourage students to practice in a more spontaneous way. So they could try and describe the, the item or the person uh, as spontaneously as, as they can and get the rest of the students to try and guess the fastest who it is. So they could start saying, I don't know, uh, for example, Soy ropa, um, soy, um, soy roja, and they could try and guess by the pictures what, what it is. Or soy un animal, soy, ten, soy grande, soy pequeño, and that way they have to come up with, it, with their own vocabulary to describe it. Uh, the Say Something Different game. Um, again, you could play this in pairs or as a group, but the, the idea is that uh, you would give them a start a sentence, for example, todos los días desayuno cereales, and a student would, would take turns to, to change one of the words or expressions, or they could add an extra detail, they could change the whole sentence. So instead of saying todos los días, they could say a veces, changing the time marker, they could say tostadas instead of cereales, changing the noun, or add their opinion, me gusta desayunar. Uh, this is an interesting one because it, it gets the students thinking as well about the grammar and why if they have changed the time marker to ayer, which is yesterday, they also need to change the verb to make it a past tense. Um, as a variation, if you want to make it even more difficult, you can direct this process and you can say to your students what you would like their changes to look like. So you could say, I want you to have a go at changing the time marker, so I want you to add an opinion, a justification and um, I would like you to change the subject as who's doing the actions so then they are talking about he, she or we instead of just practicing the I form. And um, two lies and one truth, really open task. Students can come up with any sentences they can think of to talk about themselves. Uh, it could be completely open or it could be defined by a specific topic like hobbies for example. And then we need to come up with three sentences. Um, and the rest will try to guess which two are the lies and which one is the truth. Um, as an extension, if you have higher ability students or maybe with some of your GCC or A level classes, the students could even argue about um, what they think in the target language. So one may say, Mm, creo que sí, te encanta el chocolate. La mentira es la dos. No haces deporte todos los días, solo a veces. 
and you still keep on saying no. La mentira es que toco el piano, porque toco la guitarra. And then they, they have to think about linking their ideas together, and they have a, a spontaneous conversation about what they think and why they think one may or not be the, the truth or the lie. Find someone who, um, you could play this as well, you could get them to find someone who loves tennis or hates rugby and they would need to walk around the room asking each other questions. So um, the, the interesting thing about this one is that they have to, they have to ask changing the person on the verb. So they would say, te gusta el tennis, odias el rugby. Uh, and you can also play it as a variation and play like human lingo where they have a bingo card and they need to tick. As an extension, you could even ask them to describe who the, uh, the people refer to by using the third person. So, um, a Manuel le encanta el tenis. Mm, I'm getting to do it in that way. Uh, final question two, again, another really interesting idea by Rachel Hawks. Um, in which the students are asked to talk to each other and come up with questions uh, that would be suitable for a specific answer. Uh, it doesn't only require them to change the grammar, manipulate the language and uh, think about practicing question words, but it also brings in some really interesting conversations. So for example, number three, es muy amable y abierto y explica todo muy bien. Uh, you may presumably be talking about your teacher in the context of school, but they may discuss why you would need to use professor rather than profesora because abierto is a masculine adjective, and so on. Uh, quick fire questioning. This is something we've started doing with our students this year. Uh, it can be more scaffolded, for example, in year seven or eight, and they can have the visual prompt of the questions on the board. Or you could just simply ask them, uh, okay, we're going to have five minutes of free fire, um, quick fire questioning in which I'm going to ask you a random question about a specific topic. You may want to give them a heads up. So for example, tomorrow we're going to do this on free time, revise all your free time questions, or, um, or you can just give them no prompt whatsoever, mix topics, it's, it's up to you. But it, it's a really interesting task because it also develops listenership which is the ability that will refer to um, for a person that is required to respond in real time to be able to stay in the conversation. Uh, the number heads is definitely one of my favorite activities to do. Um, it's open-ended questions. So for example, ¿Qué tipo de películas te gustan? Now a student may just say las películas de acción, but what you want to do is encourage them to develop and elaborate their answers by giving them points for different reasons. So for example, giving points if they can add an opinion, justify it, use a different tense, or I save an additional point for anything that would literally blow my mind. So if they use a subjective or if they talk about someone else. And you can put them in groups or in or in pairs and they would number themselves. So in a group of three, you would be number one, I'll be number two, you're number three. And they have a specific time allocated to to discuss the, the question and come up with the best answer possible. They write it on a mini whiteboard and then uh, they all need to be ready to answer that question because when the timer goes off, uh, I will say to them, okay, number two. So all the numbers two uh, need to stand up and come up with, will say their answer. I would say they're not allowed to read from the board, although sometimes you can make the exception that if they do, they would just lose a point. What I would recommend when you do this task is making sure you have a balance of in the person groups, uh, give them a set time depending on the difficulty of the question. Also giving them an idea of what the point system looks like. So what would it be like if you wanted to include the contents, maybe including um, that yesterday you watched a movie and what it was about. Um, but also I found that it's really helpful to involve the students in deciding how many points um, themselves or other groups should be awarded and why because it really encourages encourages them to articulate the language and it's really really linked to the criteria that they use at gcc as well so they may say oh i would uh, this was a really nice developed answer which included a lot of detail and a lot of description they justify their opinions effectively and they talked about somebody else but i would just give them three points because they they only express themselves in the present tense 
and you could also prompt them to develop their answers right there and then you could say okay could you add a few to tens to this could you justify your opinion and and sometimes just putting them on the spot like that makes them um come up with answers that would really surprise you uh, debating is uh, something that I found really useful. I, we, we had a huge push with oracy in my, in my school and something we were encouraged to use was talking points. And I thought, how can we do this in languages when you teach them the vocabulary, but it's difficult to argue uh, about different topics. But what I thought is, what is a recyclable language? What is the language that I really, really want them to be using again and again, lesson after lesson, to justify whether they agree or they don't agree with the statement and that it's also going to be helpful for them. And I developed this talking toolkit. I, I put a link to the, to the PDF so you will be able, when I send you the slides, to access it. The, the full version looks like this. So they have the International Debate Master at the front and they have uh, a range of, is, um, of phrases that they can use to add, change, develop, challenge, as well as a variety of adjectives and useful infinitives that can be used across topics. But they also had in the back international time travelers. So if you're working with questions or debates that asks them about maybe what they did last week or what they are going to study in the future, they can and have a look at just using that. So with the, with the debates, what I would say is important was that they love it because they have full control of the, of the activity and they can produce uh, their own thoughts and ideas in another language. It's really important to pre-teach them that vocabulary, so for example, in this topic um, where we looked at vivir en el campo es mejor que vivir a la ciudad, living in the countryside is better than living in the city, do you agree or disagree or not? We spent, uh, we spent a couple of lessons before looking at the advantages and disadvantages of living in the city or living in the countryside and um, that's the way that a student engaged with the vocabulary and they had the opportunity to practice that extensively before we moved on to, to the debate. Um, also, you could ask the students to summarise what their peer has said. I know summarising is a skill that they really, really struggle with at the CC level. Uh, and for summarizing, you could even use something like just a minute as a follow-up activity from a debate. And um, say so you could say, okay, we've now finished the debate. I want, you, I want to give you some time to think about the topics and come up with a one minute speech summarizing the key points. But the just a minute activity can be um, to get the students talking about a certain topic. Uh, with, uh, the idea is that they speak for one whole minute without stopping and whether that's about themselves, their school, their free time, their holidays and you can turn it into a competition. You can either say who gets closer to, to the one minute or who can speak for the whole minute without hesitation and stop them if they hesitate. Uh, it's up to you. You can, you can also use it for reflection and get them involved in thinking about what they have learned in the lesson and articulate the learning or even for narration and storytelling. Again, narrative is something that's quite difficult to develop um, at higher GCC, so giving them the opportunity to tell stories can really help with that. Open conversation, I came across this when I was planning the presentation and I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, Don Archie did an experiment and an intervention with, uh, as a whole department with a year 10 students. And what they said is that they allowed the students to have a three to five minutes peer-to-peer -peer free speaking in, of the target language in the lesson. And they were neither restricted or directed in their speech production. And they, they, the fluency of the students was really evident and they were remarkably fluent. If you're interested, I have also added a link to the whole research, but it's a, it's a thesis, it's a bit of a, a long read. But I thought it was really interesting because it can be quite scary sometimes in a class to just say, okay, free speech, go on to speak in Spanish or speak in French for five minutes. And it seems to be quite impactful. Now, probably the bit that is more relevant to us at the moment. We've looked at a variety of strategies that we can use to get the students talking, practicing the language and moving to some more spontaneity. How do we do that when we're teaching remotely? And uh, what are the apps or websites or devices that we have to support us with us? We're going to have a look at this. Um, Bokaru, uh, you can use uh, it, it's, an, it's a website 
that allows you to record um, a speech and once you finish it creates a link like the one you can see on the slide so you can just copy or create a QR code and you can share that with the students you can use it to give them instructions or modeling they can record themselves doing a task that you have asked them or you could even use it to give them verbal feedback an adaptation of wheel of names uh, you can create your own wheel of names with either a list of words a list of questions and you could ask them to uh, use this to randomize what they say and record themselves doing a task perhaps uh, ideas for this would be reading the word or the sentence that comes up on the wheel answering the question like the one on the example on the slide Say, an, uh, say a synonym of a word, name as many of a specific category, uh, say something of a category that begins with a specific letter, the so different ideas of how you can adapt wheel of, wheel of names. You can save them and you can share the ones you have pre-created or you can ask them to create their own. Um, dictation to Google Docs, I'm going to play just 10 seconds of this video to, on how you could use voice typing to get a student to practice pronunciation and reading out loud. Oh. Personalmente, voy a un colegio mixto a las afueras de Madrid. Punto. Tiene mil alumnos y 93 profesores. Punto. Además, hay 83 aulas. Punto. Okay, what they would need to make sure they do is that they change the, the language. So if they click at the top where it says tools and they go to voice typing, an icon like this. Um, will appear in the in their screen and if they click on the arrow they'll be able to change the language you could use it with sentence builders and get them to read 10 different sentences from the sentence builders and to, see, to dictate them and you can also use it with a similar based task like poems and songs the interesting thing is that it will give them feedback of the, of the pronunciation because the program would recognize uh, the sound more or less easily depending on how they are uh, says and even if you encourage them to repeat the same sentence again and again and see if they can improve the voice recognition for example uh, now <laughs> what i think is that we need to get a student using what they already use so for example the phones and the personal assistants like google assistants or alexa or cortana so i'm just going to show you a clip of how you could use this Hablame en español. Perfecto. A partir de ahora te responderé en español. ¿Qué día es hoy? Es jueves 14 de mayo de 2020. ¿Qué hora es? La hora es 8 y 3 de la tarde. ¿Qué hora es Madrid? En Madrid, España, son las 9 y 3 de la noche. ¿Qué tiempo hace hoy? El pronóstico para esta noche en Coventry es de 9 grados con cielos parcialmente nubosos. Hay 13 con cielos parcialmente nubosos. ¿Y este fin de semana? Desde mañana hasta el domingo en Coventry va a estar nublado, con máximas de entre 16 y 19, y mínima. Enséñame una foto de un tigre. Estas imágenes deberían coincidir. Una serpiente. Echa un vistazo a estas imágenes. ¿Qué sonido hace un elefante? Este es el sonido de un elefante. Traduce weekend a español. Weekend significa fin de semana en inglés. ¿Cómo se dice verde en inglés? En inglés es green. Right, you could also use it to create links to the subject, so you could prompt them with some questionings and um, creating um, different links. So, for example, with geography, ¿cuál es la capital de? or ¿dónde está? With maths, ¿cuántos son 
test for ocho and just maybe get them through a week doing the same task. And even for research projects and cultural projects, you could ask Google to say, ¿Cuándo son las fallas? ¿Dónde son las fallas? Or, ¿Qué hace la gente en Noche Vieja? And there's different things you could do with it. You could uh, give them a list of questions that they have to ask and they record themselves saying the questions. You could also ask them to write down the answer that the assistant gives them. Uh, you could do a kind of fill the gap task uh, or even a dictionary race and just give them new words that they need to find out and see who can do it in the quickest time. Collaborations through Soundtrap. Uh, now, Soundtrap for Education is uh, normally a subscription, but in response to the COVID-19 crisis, they have extended the trial period so that you would be able to use it at least until the end of the academic year. And um, you can invite uh, different people to collaborate in a project. So this would be nice to do pair or group tasks. So you could use uh, Soundtrap to ask a student to create a dialogue. You could do activities that we've discussed before, like the say something different task or the accumulation game. Um, you could even get them on, uh, say asking um, questions like in a survey or an interview format. Uh, then they can also create their own videos using puppets, for example. Hola, Michaela. Hola, mi amigo. Como estas? Muy contento, you too. Me cansada. Te gustaría ir de pesca? Qué buena idea. Vamos a... Right, again, they could use dialogues, but also because they're going to be uh, most likely at home, they may have people with them. They, you could also ask them to teach vocabulary to a family member. So they could have one of the puppets and someone else could have the other one and they may need to repeat vocabulary after them or something like that. Um, you could use it to read it out loud and you can even involve them in a cultural project like um, they dress up the puppets as a, I don't know, like a Mexican with a with hat and whatnot and one of the puppets asks questions like que comes or de donde eres and the other needs to answer as if they were that person. For example, now many of the students really like to record themselves so using things like puppets or even Chatterpix or Borky where they can use their own avatars or get a picture token can be useful for that. Uh, with Chatterpix it's really nice uh, because you all you need to do is... En el desayuno me gusta el pan tostado y la leche. No me gustan las salchichas en el desayuno. Me encantan los huevos y el café. En el almuerzo me gusta la ensalada y el agua. And Borky? Hola, me llamo Jake. Yo soy de Columbus, Ohio. Yo soy inteligente, comico y atlético. Me gusta jugar fútbol americano, estudiar en la biblioteca y tocar saxofón con mis amigos. Después de la escuela, cansado. And again, this can be useful for the just one minute task, uh, task for example, getting them to present a topic. Even for photo descriptions, I, I saw this used very effectively um, with charter pics. Um, they put a picture of a group of friends, uh, three different friends, and they created like an avatar that was describing what the people were wearing in the photo. Um, presentation of a topic, for example, or cultural projects. Similarly with the pup uh, with the puppets, you can uh, say that you visit a country and talk about the different traditions you could either do that in as a, just as a cultural research in english or you could use it in the target language and as a teacher you can even use it with your bitmoji and you could um with chat pics you could create an online where the master bitmoji is and use it to give instructions to your students now uh, flipgrid and padlet uh, they are really useful uh, platforms in which you can get the students to upload all that media content so they could put all the videos they could put the pictures they the nice thing is that you can give them feedback and they can give feedback to one another but you can also moderate the the conversations and the comments so you know kind of how they are interacting in flipgrid you need parental consent before you can use it but both are for free and in they can also use many white they can use white words or record the screens whilst they are uh, producing more activities and then it would get saved into the channel. 
Now, if you are interested in Flipgrid and Padlet, what I would advise you to do is have a look at this webinar that Joe Dale did in partnership with Pearson. He's been absolutely amazing in supporting the schools during the school closures. He's incredibly active on social media, um, and I got in touch with him asking permission to, to share the webinar with you. And, and a post that he did on, on Facebook on the Modern Language Teacher Lunch, where he discussed different apps that you can use to teach listening and speaking. And he's also recommended that I included the, um, the tutorial on using Quicker for conversations and promoting a speaking. So I would definitely encourage you to have a look at that. And now you could also get the students to create their own podcasts in websites like Anchor FM. And lastly, I saw this was a really interesting exchange program that they've created in response to the COVID-19. So if you have students that are learning English or Spanish and are age 13 to 19, uh, you have to sign up before the 31st of May. And it's going, it's a similar platform to Flipgrid or Padlet in which students can create their own media. And it lasts three weeks, starting the 8th of June. And on each of the weeks, the, weeks, the students have to produce a video and post it about a specific topic. Uh, so I thought I would share that as well. And that's all for me. Uh, we have gone through the session. All the links in the slides work to take you exactly what you want. I wouldn't want you to have to navigate through all of them together. So for example, if you want to look again at the strategies to practice spontaneity, just click on the link, it will go through. And muchas gracias por escuchar. Thank you very much and merci. Gracias. Well, uh, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you for all your amazing uh, recommendation and uh, ideas. Uh, uh, we've got time for a few questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Do you mind stopping the uh, screen share so that we can, uh, we can see you? Yeah, we'll do. Perfect. Hello. Uh, so there was a few questions about, uh, let me see. Um, to project, um, um, I've lost it now. Uh, <laughs> so, um, somebody was asking, how do you encourage and reward target language use, especially student to students? Uh, you could do that using praise. Uh, you could give them rewards like a point system, for example, or even if you don't want to point out at a student individually. Something that I used to do with my classes that worked really, really well was create a table point system. So I would have uh, like four students in a group and whenever they would use the target language um, in, a, in a nice manner they would get a point for the table um, and equally if they were not meant to and they were they would make each other lose points so it's a nice way to also promote accountability and get the students to nag each other uh, oh I'm just in Spanish or so don't use English so table points is something that seems to work. Perfect um, and uh, a few people were asking about your spot the difference task uh, and there were well, somebody, somebody was asking how do you create such resources, and somebody else was asking where do you find the the uh, pictures for those uh, activities. Okay, so there's a um, there's a huge range of resources on different websites like the TES website or Teaching Language. The uh, Association for Language Learning also has a, a space to share resources, and Facebook, especially now during. Um, the remote teaching period, people having uh, sharing with courses like crazy. If you go to Rachel Hawke's website as well, uh, the, she um, she has a specific area dedicated to speaking and a spontaneous talk, and she has presentations that you can download. And uh, there's a huge variety of resources there that you can use in your lessons. Excellent. Thank you so much again. Uh, so for everyone listening, uh, you'll be receiving an email over the weekend tomorrow. Uh, with a copy of the slides uh, Paula has, has shown today, uh, as well as a link to the recording. Uh, on Fridays, the 22nd, so next week, and the 29th, the week after, uh, we plan to host uh, show and tell webinars. Uh, so if you'd like to contribute by presenting a, an activity, a resource, an idea, or whatever, we invite you to uh, submit a proposal. Uh, uh, they will, details will be in the, in the follow up emails you'll get tomorrow. Uh, so you can do that online. There will be an online form so you can submit your, your uh, proposal there. Uh, the next webinar, uh, otherwise, will be uh, next Friday. Um, is it? Let me double check. Uh, it might be Tuesday, actually. Uh, yes, Tuesday, sorry. Uh, with uh, Beverly um, and she, Beverly uh, uh, Kukta Jackson. Uh, she's a French teacher from uh, Ontario, Canada. 
and she'll be sharing your tips on uh, speaking assessment, so more ideas on the speaking uh, task. Uh, and to register for Beverly's webinar, uh, just head to linguoscope.com slash training. Uh, thank you again, Paula, and thank you everybody for attending. We've had an amazing, uh, an amazing number of people, close to 500, so that's the maximum capacity anyway. So I think you, you broke a record, Paula. Great, that's really exciting. And thank you so much all for you and Inera for your encouraging comments. That's lovely. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.